It says that we're uh, that we're live, so we're on. We're going on to our YouTube channel as well, so we'll uh, we, we'll make a start properly. And so the uh, the title for today is the first white love, the Eucharist, the miracle of the Lord's real presence, and um, I'll just show the screen for a moment. So we can get started. And of course, by calling it the first white love, we instantly make reference to the apparition of the Virgin of Revelation at Tre Fontane. And, you know, uh, uh, during uh, her apparition to, to Bruno, Our Lady said, the, the true church of my son is founded on three white loves, the Eucharist, the Immaculate, and the Holy Father. And so we can see from that the, if you like, the, the, the central importance of the, of the Eucharist, which is the presence of the Lord. And I always love this image where we show uh, Eucharistic adoration actually at the grotto with our, with our Lady behind, because our Lady always leads us to a son. And I think whenever there is Eucharistic adoration, we would always find our Lady, our Lady there. So how did tonight come about? Well, a recent we, we live in, in challenging times really. And a recent uh, Pew Research Centre study came up with a with a, a worrying statistic in that they said that um, 69% of Catholics in the United States believe that the bread and wine used in Mass are symbols of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so I have to say, when 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 I heard that statistic, I wasn't I wasn't um, I was surprised at the extent of it. And I, I don't think necessarily, if you were to take the statistics in England or Ireland or even Italy, that we'd find a great uh, difference. Because how often do we really ponder what the Eucharist is, and are we so sure? that we transmit the belief that our Lord is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity uh, to those who we meet. And if someone was to see us at church, would they understand by the way we act that that is what we believe? The church prays as she believes. And therefore, very often today when we see lots of um, if you like, a, la a lack of delicacy, a lack of reverence in, in the church, the, the, the root of it is often that they've not got quite right the tremendous gift that the Eucharist is. And that was even more underlined when, you know, when we were talking about preparations for First Holy Communion and, you know, they were, they were lamenting to say, that not only do the children not know that the Eucharist is the body uh, and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and that he's really present, but also the parents didn't know. And therefore we have a, you know, if the parents don't know, how are the children ever going to grow up with a true devotion to our Lord, really present body, blood, soul and divinity? in the Blessed Sacrament. And therefore, I have to say, I, I, I was always, and every time I think about it, I always feel that uh, we have to do something as a, in the name of the church, but also as a sister who, who occurs about uh, souls. We, we, we're all called to be spiritual mothers. Every sister's called to that. And so I'm, 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 uh, I, I don't think we can ever talk about this subject enough and so we have to uh, present the church's teaching uh, to uh, to anyone who will listen really and so tonight it's just really the uh, the opportunity to present the truth of the lord's pre real presence in the eucharist in a very clear way so that whether uh, you you understand that the lord's present or you have some questions, there is a situation where you where you can you can ask those questions. 
And so if uh, you're not clear on some aspect of the teaching, then there's also, again, the opportunity to, um, to, to ask questions and learn. And so that, you know, everybody can find something, hopefully through what uh, I want to say this evening. Um, and so that at the end of it, we will all grow in our devotion and understanding about this very deep, wonderful, or dare I say even shocking, mystery. I say shocking because it's absolutely incredible that our Lord Jesus is present here on earth. And, and that's, that's, that's a shocking thing that Catholics believe. And, um, you know, when, uh, you know, we, we, we're, adore, we're, we're sometimes they say you, you adore, it's idolatry, no? <laughs> uh, uh, so shocking is this belief. And so we have to understand it uh, very well. Um, why do we believe that our Lord is present under the form of bread in, in the Eucharist? And so to help me explain this, uh, hopefully in an accessible way, I'm going to draw on the teachings from the Catechism, the writing of the saints, and also the history of the church to talk about our Lord's real presence in the Eucharist. Now, there are many aspects when we want to talk about the Eucharist. It's an infinite subject. We could talk uh, uh, infinitely about this wonderful supreme gift by our Lord, but today I, I want to just concentrate on this aspect of our Lord's uh, real presence. And so we'll, we'll start. So I'll share the screen again. Okay. Okay, so we, we start, I start off really with, with, with a simple question. Real presence. What does that mean? So when we see, when we talk about the real presence, what do we mean when we say that? And so drawing from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1413, I want to highlight the second part of the phrase, which actually comes from the Council of Trent. And it says, under the consecrated species of bread and wine, Christ himself, living and glorious, is present in a true real and substantial manner, his body and his blood, with his soul and his divinity. And so that is uh, very, very clear, if you like. And so, how, how, can we say in simpler language, I'm sure we can, we can find simpler language than that used by the Council of of Trent, what does it mean? The church teaches us that our Lord Jesus is really present in the Eucharist. And we can make it explicit. When the Eucharist is reserved in the tabernacle or when we receive it uh, from the priest after the consecration of the Holy Mass, Christ is present. He is there. And so there's, there's, there's a great saint uh, a blessed, actually, he's not, he's not quite a saint, I'm sure he will be, uh, Carlo Acutis. And he, and he, 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 said, he explained it really, really well, I think, because he said this. We can find God with his body, his soul, and his divinity, present in all the tabernacles of the world. If we think about it, we are more fortunate than those who lived 2,000 years ago in contact with Jesus because we have God really and substantially present with us always. It is enough to visit the closest church. We have Jerusalem on our doorsteps. Jerusalem is in every church. And this is really fantastic now, because very often, you know, if you think, if you read the scriptures and you go back and you say, well, gosh, you know, if Jesus was here, 
I could go and ask him, I could go and share this problem. He would solve what, what worries me, he would tell me the answer. And of course, what we believe is that Jesus is really there in the tabernacle. And, and of course, or when we receive him in the Eucharist, where we come, we're united to him in communion. And so, uh, to really, Jesus is the answer to all our problems. And we can go and visit him just as if when he walked the streets of, of Galilee and he wanted, and people were asking them for healing when they were asking for his help. Jesus is as really present in the church. Now, for Carlo Acutis, this, this thought would put him on a wonderful journey that would lead him towards his sanctity but he started a reflection and he said my goodness if Jesus is really there why why aren't the churches overflowing why aren't the churches packed out because if someone really famous came to town would everybody try and see that person but why don't they try and see the Lord do we try and see the Lord in that way are we conscious of his real presence? And does that form the way that we behave when we walk through the door of the church? It's fabulous, isn't it? You know, because uh, uh, we, can, we can think about how wonderful it will be to see the Lord. And when we go into, into church, of course, he's there when the Eucharist is reserved in the tabernacle. And we're even more closely united to him when we're receiving in Holy Communion. But when we talk about presence, what do we really mean, yeah? Because <laughs> obviously we, we can't see the Lord in his body when we, when we go into the church. We see him under the form of bread and wine. But what I want to do to try and get across the importance of this mystery is to have a little think about what we mean when we say, when we talk about presence. And, you know, today we've got an awful lot of experience of different kinds of presence, haven't we? I mean, today, you know, we're, we're joined from various parts of the world via the electronics. And we can say in a certain way we are present to each other but not. We could even think about presence, you know, when you go to school, when, when I used to go to school, you know, they'd shout the register uh, and you'd say, present, yes, I'm here, which means I'm physically in that place, ready to listen. I am in the, in the flesh, present for that situation. Or in another context, the other day I was, I, was, uh, I, I was half doing something else and the doorbell rang, so I was making my way to answer the door. And uh, there was one of our old ladies in the, in the old folks' home in the corridor. And I didn't even really acknowledge it because I had two things on my mind and I had to answer the door quickly. And at the end, she stopped me and she said, you didn't say hello. And in that moment, yes, I was physically present. We were in the same corridor. But I obviously wasn't sufficiently present to that, to that lady such that she felt that uh, I was giving her the attention that perhaps she needed. And so what we learn from that is presence is not just a physical thing. You can be physically there, but not as I was the other day with, with, with our friend. A person is not only matter. We are body and soul. And so, you know, we can have another example. Someone lives in another part of the country or in another, even in another country. You love that person. You're thinking of that person. In a sense, when you do that, they are present in your life. You bring them into your life by thinking about them. But that's not what we would call a, a real presence. 
but instead we know the real presence when we experience it. And indeed, when we experience it, all our faculties are, are engaged and we're present physically and also in, in, our, in our minds and our thoughts to that person. And so presence is a hard thing to, uh, to talk about, to describe, but you, it's something that we're aware of. I've had the experience of getting to know many people in this time of the COVID over the Zoom. But you don't know them the same way you know them when you finally meet them in person. There's a, there's a whole other level of exchange. There's a whole other level of communication that goes on. And so we can even ask ourselves, would you be happy? You can see your loved ones over Zoom. Would you be happy with that kind of a relationship forever? And I think everybody would reply, oh, absolutely not. We've had enough of the Zoom. We want, we want to see people. We want that, that communication. And so when we talk about presence, we talk about really being there. And it's exactly, and you know it when you experience it. And it's about being there in person with your heart and your mind. And therefore, when it's about, if you like, really encountering that person who is there. And so when we talk about our Lord's real presence, we talk about our Lord being really there, ready to encounter us, ready to welcome us, ready to listen to us. And there's something that must go on for that, that to work. We have to be present to him too. We have to tune in, if you like, so that we know that we are entering his presence. For example, when you enter a church, do you attune yourselves to the fact that you are going to greet our dear Lord in the tabernacle? And indeed, the, the sisters, before we enter the, the chapel to pray uh, the divine office, we have something called statsia where we stay outside the chapel for five minutes to prepare our minds and hearts for this meeting with the Lord so that we can pray in his name and relate to him properly, to be truly present in the prayers that we will say in his name. So we pray through Jesus to the Father. Um, and so this is, uh, this is important. And indeed, the words of St. Alphonsus, when St. Alphonsus wrote many beautiful things about the Blessed Sacrament and our Lord's true presence. And he says this wonderful prayer, which starts off just like this. My Lord Jesus Christ, who, because of your love for men, remain night and day in the Blessed Sacrament, full of pity and love, awaiting calling and welcoming all who come to visit you. And so this presence is so real that our Lord awaits us. He's glad to see us. It's as if we're the only person in the world when we, when we enter. He's always present to us. And are we always present to him? He is physically there for us. And he has got so many gifts to bestow on us. And... He wants only our, our attention. And so with that, hopefully that's given you a few things to, to ponder. And so now I'd like to go on to the, to the next question. That is, how is it possible for Jesus to be really present in the Eucharist? And this, if you like, is the, is the heart of the, of the teaching of the church, and so as we go forward. So we know that Jesus is present in the Eucharist because he said so. At the Last Supper, and we all know the words because we hear them so many times at Mass, we hear the words, 
This is my body. This is my blood. And so this is very important. Our Lord didn't say this is a symbol of my body or this is a symbol of my blood. He said this is the phrase is very, very simple. And it's also explicit. He said this is my body. This is my blood. And so by the Lord's own words, he tells us that he is present in the signs of bread and wine. And so there are two important points to make. Firstly, we believe that Jesus is the word made flesh, God made man. And so the same God who made heaven and earth then came, was sent by the Father and came to the earth. And so we have to therefore say, if we go to Genesis, we know the power of God. Because if we, if we just read the first chapter of Genesis chapter 3, we hear the words, God said, let there be light, and there was light. So God said something, and he brought it about. God's words have a creative effect. God has the power to do anything in heaven and on earth. And what he says, he accomplishes. And therefore, we have to remember that he has the power to make himself present under the form of bread and wine. And therefore, he, may, he can make himself truly present in the Eucharist. And so the first reason that we must believe that this is true is because God himself said it. And indeed, St. Cyril in the early church says, do not doubt whether this is true but rather receive the words of the Saviour in faith. For since he is the truth, he cannot lie. And so this is very, very important that we, we, we believe our Lord is present in the Eucharist because he said it. <laughs> and therefore, we should believe that that is true. And then the second reason I want to come to is, if you like, not only did the Lord at the Last Supper say, this is my body, this is my blood, he also prepared us for this great mystery. And indeed, in the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, we have this wonderful bread of life discourse. And in that bread of life discourse, the Lord prepares us for what would be the, the Eucharist. And the Lord, and there are many, many things that we can say about these verses of uh, St. John's Gospel, but I want to only concentrate on those that relate to our Lord's presence, a, a true presence. And so the Lord declares, so just to just to put it a little bit in context, we've had the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And then many people have been following the Lord because they were impressed by that, that same miracle. And so the Lord in the end says, you're only following me because of that miracle, <laughs> not because, uh, because you, you believe. And so in the end, there's this great discourse on the bread of life. And the Lord says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the desert, and they are dead. But this is the bread which comes down from heaven, so that a person may eat it and not die. And then the Lord went on, he says, I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, for the life of the world. Now here you have a, an explicit reference. The bread that I shall give, the Eucharist, is my flesh for the life of the world. Now naturally, a first century Jew would have found that very, very difficult because in the book of Leviticus, it was forbidden to eat the, uh, the, the flesh 
uh, and blood of animals. And so uh, the Jews then started arguing amongst themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So instantly Jesus is aware that this is a difficult teaching. The Jews have reacted instantly. And Jesus had the opportunity to step back from the teaching. He could have modified his language, but instead he goes on and instead reaffirms it even more. So in the next lines, he says, Jesus replied to them, in truth, I tell you, if you don't, do not eat of the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Anyone who does eat of my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life. And I shall raise that person up on the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I live in that person. And of course, we all remember what happened. After hearing it, many of his followers said, this is intolerable language. How could anyone accept it? And so, as we can see, the Lord had the chance to modify what he was saying, but he continued by identifying, he makes a, a, a direct identification between him being the bread of life and it being his flesh and the wine being his, his blood. And therefore, um, the, uh, we can say that our dear Lord, knowing that this would be um, shocking, it was shocking to the Jews of his time, and may even be shocking to us today when we think that God is present amongst us, continue to teach us um, that uh, he is the, the bread of life, the bread that has come down from heaven. And so after that, I think what we'll do is we'll just stop for a moment just to see if anyone's any questions, anything you want to ask. Okay, is that, is that quite clear? Okay, well, we'll carry on and we'll do, we'll do questions at the end. So then the next, the next part then is to say, well, the Lord has prepared us for this mystery. And then there was, of course, the Last Supper where he instituted the sacrament, he instituted the Eucharist. But how do we understand how the Lord is present under the form of bread. How is it explained? And so for that, we turn really to the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas. So how is the Lord present in the Eucharist? And so again, we we draw from the same part of the catechism, the first part of that first phrase that we saw at the start of the talk, says, by the consecration, the transubstantiation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ is brought about. And so, transubstantiation is already complicated word in a certain sense it's not the words of every day and there are those who say we shouldn't use the words of every day to express such uh, an important mystery but what we but we need to understand what what that transubstantiation actually means what it means is that the substance of the bread becomes the lord's body and the substance of the wine becomes the Lord's blood, while still retaining the appearance of bread and wine. So, as you can see in my uh, little diagram, <laughs> you can see before the consecration, we have the, the hosts that are made, yes, very often by sisters who 
uh, spend their the lives making the altar breads, the unleavened bread. And so there's the, the species, if you like, of the bread and the substance of the bread. So the bread uh, looks like bread and its substance, its taste, uh, uh, its underlying quality is that of bread. And so it looks like it and its substance is bread. That's before the consecration. So before the priest extends his hands over the bread and utters the words of consecration. Uh, the, uh, what we offer is bread. But after the consecration, there's a change because with on, on, under the command of the Lord, this is my body, this is my blood, that is what is brought into effect. And so the species of the bread, so the look of the bread remains the same, but the substance, the essence of what it is, is changed into our Lord's own body, his real presence. And I think there's nothing more beautiful than to see this little image with our Lord there, which helps to make it clear, hopeful. So the, the way it looks remains the same, but what it is, has totally changed. It's totally something else. Its essence is something else. And so, and so the same with the wine. The wine continues to look like wine, but after the words of consecration, this is my blood, the wine has become the blood of the Lord. And so we, we are, are told, and the Catechism says, the Eucharistic presence of Christ begins at the moment of the consecration, and his presence endures as long as the Eucharistic species subsist. So as long as the Eucharistic uh, species exists, our Lord is present. And therefore the hosts which are not consumed during the Holy Mass and are held in the tabernacle, our Lord is present in the, uh, then in the tabernacle. And so, the, the next part, um, you can see, uh, you can see that the next part of the teaching is that the whole Christ is present in every Eucharistic species and every part. So the Catechism says, Christ is present whole and entire in each of the species and whole and entire in each of the parts in such a way that the breaking of the bread does not divide Christ. And I think the image makes it very clear what we're trying to get across. So when you break, when the priest breaks the host, the whole Christ is, is the in both parts. And so this is what we mean when we say, our Lord is truly present, he is the. Now then, obviously in heaven, he resides um, under the, he, he has the, the form of a, his body, but after the consecration, he's present under the form of bread in the Eucharist by a miracle that God can bring about because of his own authority. He said that that is so. So there are things to underline because very often, Today, there's lots of confusion and they say, no, the Eucharist is just a symbol. No, it's not. It's the real presence of the Lord. The Lord did not say, I am symbolically present. He said, this is my body. This is my blood. This is no symbol. It's not enough. Um, it is the real presence of the Lord. And something else which is often useful to, to, rem to remind ourselves the fact that our Lord is really, truly present in the Eucharist was never seriously doubted until the 11th century. And then, of course, more, more de definitely during the Protestant Reformation. But all the early fathers of the church, from the apostles, the fathers of the church, they all believed in the real presence of the Lord in the Eucharist. And there are many beautiful phrases 
by the fathers of the church who express this beautiful belief. And so um, that the Eucharist is only a symbolic presence of blood um, came in by Berenganus of, Tour, of Tours, and that was refuted by Pope Nicholas II, who called the Synod in 1059. Then we go on to the time of Luther, and this, uh, this era creeps in. And this is what we, we hear more, more frequently today, that the, the Lord is only a symbolic presence. No, our Lord is truly present. A symbolic presence is not enough when we read the, the scriptures. And so the essence, the St. Thomas Aquinas did a wonderful job of explaining in philosophical language something that is complicated to understand, and that's the transubstantiation. And so that is the Catholic view that the, the, the bread looks like bread, it tastes like bread, but its substance, its essence is changed by the power of God. And so we have this wonderful uh, phrase, uh, 1381 in the Catechism says, that in this sacrament of the true body and blood of Christ, his true blood is something that cannot be apprehended by the senses, says St. Thomas, only by faith, which relies on divine authority. For this reason, uh, in a commentary on Luke, uh, St. Cyril says, do not doubt whether this is true, but rather receive the words of the Saviour in faith, for since he is true, he cannot lie as I said before. And then there's that wonderful Eucharistic hymn, as we know, St. Thomas Aquinas was given the job of writing the liturgy for the Feast of Corpus Christi. And we've got that Adore Te Devote. And in that hymn, that Eucharistic hymn, St. Thomas very aptly says, sight, touch, taste, fail to perceive you. By hearing alone, you are securely believed. So by hearing the priest's words, we believe that our Lord has come present in the Eucharist, really and truly present. So we have, this is a march, this is a journey of faith. We have to use our faith in order to access the fact that our Lord is truly present in the tabernacle. And so this is very good because it teaches us to be as obedient to the word of God as our lady. We have to believe what our Lord says and we have to show an act uh, that shows that we believe it. And so therefore, when we, when we go into the church, we reverence the blessed sacrament, believing fully, as fully as we can, that our Lord is present. If we don't believe, if it's a struggle, oh Lord, help my unbelief. And so we pray, we ask our Lord to help us to understand it even more. Now then what I want to do, rather than stay on the philosophical part, is to say, well, let's have a look at some of the, way, some of the miracles that have shown our dear Lord's presence. Because whenever the faith decreases in the Eucharist, the Lord has always sent miracles and there's been some astounding miracles. And so I just, um, Carlo Acutis wrote about all the, um, all the Eucharistic miracles that have been approved by the church and placed it in a book. Uh, I have to say it's a fantastic book and anybody who has doubts about our Lord's presence should read that book because there is something in every miracle to help an aspect of our faith. And so I've picked a few uh, a few of mine which should illustrate um, with the miracles some of the things that I've said this evening. Not that the miracles prove what we've said. We, the, the Lord has taught it, the church has, has been there and has said this for, for many centuries and therefore that is enough. But very often the Lord sends something to help our faith, to help us on the journey and that's what these miracles do. And so we've got the miracle at Bolsena. This is the Mass at Bolsena. In 1263, 
uh, Peter from Prague was on a pilgrimage to Rome and he, he was doubting our Lord's presence in the Blessed Sacrament. And so he stopped to say offer mass at Bolsena. And as he broke the host, it bled onto the corporal, the altar cloth. And so, of course, with that, he saw a physical manifestation of the fact that uh, the Eucharist is our Lord's body, blood, soul and divinity. And so he went to find Pope Urban VIII, who was at Orvieto, who investigated the circumstances and proclaimed a Eucharistic miracle. And even to this day, if you go to Orvieto, and there's been a great cathedral constructed in order to uh, receive that corporal that bled from the Eucharist, when from that, that very holy mass. And therefore, again, we see a physical manifestation of that which is hidden from our eyes normally. And here's another, this is Lanciano. And this, I've actually been here last year, just before the lockdown, the sisters went, we went on a pilgrimage and we were able to see. And so in the year 750, a monastic priest doubted, again, the real presence of our Lord. And during the consecration, the host changed into flesh and the wine into blood. And can, can we believe that that is still intact today? I mean, this is hundreds of years, uh, centuries after the event, and that flesh is still intact. Now, the blood, which you can see in the lower container, separated into five parts. And oddly enough, when they weighed the, uh, these parts of the, of the blood, they, have, they weigh the same separately as they do all together. And so this shows that the whole Christ is present in every part, in every particle of the Eucharist. How, how, how amazing is that? And so we have an element of the faith and we can see this indication also in the miracle. Tess in 1973 on the tissue said the tissue is living because it reacts so quickly to the 500 and odd tests that were done. And then in the end, they made a declaration to say that science is unable to provide an explanation, but it isn't due to some middle age um, preservation of the middle ages, they rule that out. And therefore we have again this wonderful miracle. So anybody who comes to Italy and feels like taking the journey down to Lanciano, I would absolutely um, recommend it. So again, we have, Ah, the, 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 the thing that I forgot to say is that the blood type, oddly enough, is the same blood type as the man of the Shroud of Turin. But then it should be, shouldn't it? <laughs> this next miracle I also like. This is a miracle that occurred in André de la Réunion uh, when Abbot Henry Lacan in 1902, whilst celebrating the Holy Mass saw Jesus's face appear in the Eucharistic monstrance. And this was seen by very many thousands of people. And so again, we have this illusion, this proof, if you like, of our Lord's real presence in the Eucharist, another wonderful miracle. Teresa Newman is uh, a mystic um, who was born in 1898, and she, she, she received a, a miraculous cure. And then shortly after, she would then go on to receive the stigmata. Um, and during this, she, she, she was a mystic, and so she then, um, she then uh, decided that she should live only by nourishing herself on the Eucharist alone. And so this, this mystic spent over, I think it's over 50 odd years, nourished only by the Eucharist. And so when we say that the Eucharist is necessary for life, Theresa Newman is someone who would, um, who would certainly hold that, that, that up. So the Eucharist is the, the only real nourishment we need. And indeed, even Hitler, 
gave an order that she was not to be touched. And so um, holiness can be a frightening thing. <laughs> And then, of course, we can't, we, we can't come to the end without thinking about what Bruno himself said after the apparition of the Virgin of Revelation. After the apparition of the Virgin of Revelation, Bruno took his children to the Trappist Monastery. And there, before the tabernacle, he said to his children, do you remember that I told you that Jesus is not in the Eucharist, in that small piece of white bread? Well, now I want to tell you that Jesus is there. He is present. He is real. And so, I think it's perhaps fitting that I, I conclude this part of the presentation with the words of the Virgin of Revelation. And she uh, encourages us. She told us the first white love is the Eucharist, and then she encourages us to go and spend time with our Eucharistic Lord. She says, go to my Eucharistic son and warm him with your love. He awaits you and he's there to be consumed. It is consuming him and experiencing him that you have life because by giving you his life, he gives you eternal life. Meditate on this knowledge and you will understand it by meditating on the word of God the word of love, live the sacraments, practice the virtues, and always love and forgive each other in love and charity. I think this is very, very important. Our Lady said, it is in consuming him and experiencing him that you have life. So we have to remember that we receive Holy Communion, and it is, in a sense, communion. It is communion. What does that mean? That we're in communion with God. We are united with God. And therefore, we have to receive Holy Communion. But for that, uh, for us to receive it properly, we have to also, there, are, there also has to be truth. We have to also acknowledge in truth that our Lord is present. And then that communion is ever more full. And we're able to receive more gifts from our Lord. And so our, our Lady speaks about this very deep communion from each of us. And indeed, the saints, what did they say? Saint Irenaeus, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, when we eat normally, the food that we eat is transformed into our body. But uh, Augustine said it the other way around, it is not you who uh, is not God who is uh, brought, made into you, but you are made into God. And therefore, by through Holy Communion, we are united. We, um, we go on the way of holiness in a special way with our dear Lord. And therefore, it's important that we experience the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. It's important that we have a relationship with the Lord in order to understand his real presence, who can really explain this wonderful gift? Who can explain the mystery of our Lord, that our Lord awaits for us in the tabernacle and is there? But for those who do go and visit him, they're able to share their experience of living with him, their experience of sharing their lives with him. And in fact, uh, if I can find it very quickly, I just want to... Uh, Carlo Acutis went to visit the Lord every day. He went to Holy Mass uh, every day. And he, he said this. Let's have a look. Let me see if I can find it. He said this on Eucharistic adoration. Two things, really. He said, if we go out in the sun, we get a suntan. But when we get in front of Jesus in the Eucharist, we become saints. And so there's that sense of the Lord changing us into him, changing us into the holy conduits for the teaching. I like to speak with Jesus about 
all that I am living and feeling. To him I can always confide something. I can also complain, question him about his silence and tell him what I do not understand. And then within me, I find a word that he sends to me, a moment of the gospel that fills me with conviction and certainty. And so in the, in the words of, of Carla, we're encouraged in our faith to, to draw closer to our Lord, to grow uh, to a greater appreciation of his presence in the Blessed Sacrament.